So good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of myself and my colleague, Paul Sturton, to the Bard Graduate Center, and especially to our symposium on reforming modernism, craft, design, and architecture at the Bauhaus. Um, and it's maybe even a greater pleasure to kick things off tonight by introducing our keynote speaker, um, somebody whose work on the history of German design I've admired for many years and whose thinking around questions of design and politics specifically has been critical for my own. Professor Paul Betts teaches modern European history at the University of Oxford. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1995 and is the author of so many books and articles on modern European and German cultural history that I'm not going to try to list them all right now. Um, but especially relevant to our symposium and to my own scholarship and my teaching here at BGC are two books, um, his 2004 Authority of Everyday Objects, A Cultural History of West German Industrial Design, published by University of California Press, and also Within Walls, Private Life in the German Democratic Republic, published by Oxford in 2010, which was awarded the Frankel Prize in Contemporary History by the Wiener Library. More recently, Professor Betts co-curated the traveling photography exhibition, Tito in Africa, Picturing Solidarity, which after making stops in Belgrade and Oxford, just closed at the Venda Museum of the Cold War in Los Angeles. His new book project, Contest for Civilization, The Remaking of Europe After 1945, is right now forthcoming from Basic Books. Tonight, Professor Betts will open what I hope is going to be a productive and hopefully provocative conversation around the Bauhaus and its legacy for craft, design, and architecture by sharing some reflections on the Bauhaus at 100. Please join me in welcoming Paul Betts. Great. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation, the kind introduction, Freya. Can you hear me in the back? OK. Um, I should say it's probably not very good form to uh, begin with a confession and disclaimer. Uh, but in this case, it seems warranted. I'm not a design historian by training, but I'm rather a uh, cultural historian of modern Europe. The difference is probably best noted in the number and quality of my slides, uh, which are comparatively few and not very polished. Um, I should also add that I haven't worked directly on design history uh, for some years, but delighted to have the chance to uh, to speak here at the Bard Graduate Center, um, not least because it provided an occasion for me to catch up with some of the new publications on the Bauhaus's centenary. But what does the Bauhaus anniversary actually mean for us today? In this talk, I will first say a few words about its legacy and blind spots, after which I'll turn my attention to Bauhaus designer Wilhelm Wagenfeld as a brief case study. And then in the last part, I'll fan out to talk about uh, some general reflections. Now, as a departure point, I'd like to begin with a personal anecdote. In 1991, I was in Berlin conducting some research at the Bauhaus archive on the post-1945 remaking of the Bauhaus legacy in West German architecture and design, a subject to which I'll return a little bit later. That spring, I attended a conference at the archive on the relationship between Bauhaus and National Socialism organized by the Munich architectural historian Winfried Nettinger. This was a delicate theme, to be sure, and the presentations there, whose contributions were published in edited volume, sorry, I'm just gonna try to, uh, that following uh, year, this is the cover of the book itself, this is the Bauhaus in National Socialism, um, you can see that there, revealed the ways in which some of the leading Bauhaus figures, particularly Habit Bayer, Mies van der Rohe, and especially Walter Gropius, had either worked for or submitted designs for competitions during the Third Reich, with the aim of helping the new regime develop a more internationalist face. The conference presenters arrived with illustrative evidence of these links, as noted in these slides. I'm just going to run through some of the uh, illustrations actually appeared in the book itself. This is one here by Bayer, this uh, the Great German Exhibition, 1936, and one of the great Bauhaus graphic designers. Uh, this one, not such a clear kind of pixelated um, when Bayer was working for the German Propaganda Agency from 1937. This one, a design by Mies van der Rohe, uh, the German Pavilion, the Brussels World Exhibition, 1935, with these kind of abstract uh, swastika on the flag. And this design by Walter Gropius, uh, designed for the Haus der Arbeit, the House of Work competition, uh, 
in 1934. Now, for some of you, these photos may seem surprising, given that for decades we've inherited the view that Nazi culture, and recall the term itself, used to be considered an oxymoron, was synonymous with blood and soil pastoralism and racist folkishness whose hatred of all things modern culminated in the infamous Degenerate Art Exhibition of 1937. You're familiar with this famous exhibition cover. Much of this is true, but it is worth remembering that in the early years of the Third Reich, it was, it was unclear which way things were going in the cultural battle between uh, Alfred Rosenberg, the folkish ideologue, and Josef Goebbels, the cultural modernist, for the cultural identity of the new regime. And many both within Germany and abroad uh, expected that Goebbels' championing of industrial modernism would follow the pro-modern fascist sensibilities of Mussolini's Italy. Plenty of supposedly anti-fascists were keen to contribute, and this included some Bauhaus architects and designers. Now, my point is not to impugn these figures as Nazi sympathizers, not in any way, but only to say that what modernism and Nazism meant culturally in the aftermath of the Nazi seizure of power in 1933 was still unclear to many at the time. What ended up happening was that the high profile showcase venues of Nazi culture, such as the Degenerate Art Exhibition and the follow up shows on German art at Munich's House of German Art. Oops, sorry, a second. As you see, the kinds of work here presented then in the House of German Art in Munich, kind of stuff you've seen probably many times before, presented Nazism as a sworn enemy of modernism. This was best seen in the fields of representational architecture and painting. By contrast, industrial modernism flourished in the realm of industrial building, housewares, and high-tech projects like automobile design during the regime, as noted in these figures. This is a Mercedes prototype in the Speer Pavilion, the World Exhibition in Paris, 1937. This kind of embracing of uh, industrial modernism. The contradictory, uh, I think I might have another. No, I'll wait for that, sorry. The contradictory nature of Nazi modern is no doubt familiar to you, but what struck me at the 1991 Bauhaus conference was the level of outrage and vitriol hurled at the presenters from members of the audience who were visibly angered that Mies, and especially Gropius, could be mentioned in the same breath as Goebbels. After all, closing down the Bauhaus was one of the first actions of the new regime after its takeover in 1933, dramatizing the point that the Bauhaus's career perfectly matched the doomed history of the utopian hopes and disappointments of the Weimar Republic itself. That its main figures emigrated first to England and then to the US, also helps cement this idea of the Bauhaus as, as an emblem of anti-fascism and cultural li liberalism gone global. The 1991 conference breached this mythic taboo, and in particular the neat line fencing off the Weimar Republic from uh, the toxicity of Nazi Germany. But in light of the reaction from the audience, most of whom were older West Germans, why were the Bauhaus and its central protagonists treated as such sacred and untouchable figures? After all, Bauhaus modernism had been subjected to uh, harsh criticism for decades, but rarely from this perspective. The bigger question was why was there so little interest in broaching the contradictions uh, and difficult historical questions about Bauhaus history itself? The most cursory glance at the new crop of books published to celebrate the, um, the new, whoops, yeah, sorry. Uh, the new the Bauhaus centenary reveal uh, that most of them tend to recapitulate the main story that we've grown accustomed to for decades. To my mind, the most interesting books have been on gender and the global reach of the design school, but others have been quite conventional. I'm just going to show you. And these are two books I think that are uh, that have been quite interesting, in fact, quite worth reading in terms of uh, kind of new views on this story. And we'll hear from Elizabeth Otto, I think, uh, more tomorrow on some of this. To this day, Bauhaus history is still a kind of zombie literature that tends, above all, to reproduce the standard venerable stories for a new generation of readers. And no doubt, many of the contributors tomorrow will challenge these and other questions about the Bauhaus history. But where did this anti-historical attitude at and toward the Bauhaus come from? For starters, one might say that the disinclination to look to the past was built in the very concrete foundation of the Bauhaus from the beginning. 
take the famed Vorkurs, or basic course, which was the foundational art course required of all Bauhaus students, and one that has become a pedagogical fixture of uh, design schools from uh, all over the world from the 1950s onward. And you've kind of seen this image, I'm sure, many times in terms of the, you know, the acquainting students with uh, materials and the kind of approach to the basic course. Now, this course was, of course, the brainchild of one of the school's most influential teachers, Johannes Itten, who sought to devise the Bauhaus's preliminary course to force students to engage directly with materials in a tactile way, in his case, in an effort to link design to spiritual awakening. And this is some images from the kind of work this produces, Aria Sharon, one of the Bauhaus students, the kinds of kind of work that they were doing then uh, in these uh, four courses. Uh, Iden himself was a Mazdanstan, its spiritualist devotee and a kind of guru at the Weimar Bauhaus, this kind of figure in the way he kind of presented himself. Uh, and often walked around the school in a kind of self-made tunic like some sort of ancient mystic. His students undertook meditation, yoga, dress regimens, and occultist dietary purges as part of an Eastern influence back to the crafts educational philosophy. Observers at the time remarked that his students looked typically pale, wore bizarre clothes, and, strong smell, uh, and strongly smelled of garlic. Uh, Itten's Back to the Crafts course blended building, making, and learning in new ways based on a kind of John Dewey-inspired learning by doing model with echoes of Pestalozzi and Montessori. Notable, too, was that the early Bauhaus was built around painters, not architects or designers. In fact, seven of the eight initial faculty appointments were painters. With time, Gropius found Itten's influence excessively cultic and even embarrassing and dismissed him in 1923 in favor of the more hard-headed and technology-friendly Laszlo Mholy Nagy, usually dressed in a kind of technician's uh, outfit and tie. Uh, in any case, Itten's approach reflected the school's larger ideal of combining fine and applied arts, an ideal also reflected in the architecture of the Dessau campus, especially in so much as the workshops were integrated into the school campus and the way that the student and master houses were designed in a uniform style. This non-hierarchical communal ideal, notably the Bauhaus banned the title of professors, was also reflected in the Bauhaus's name, which was a reference to the German medieval guilds, the so-called Bauhüter, in which masters and students at work in close relationship in a kind of updated version of a medieval mason's lodge. The Vorkurs, that foundation course, slide makes clear that the course was based on the study of materials and colors, and students were encouraged to approach design problems from the ground up. What is interesting and what is what was left out. An element rarely discussed in the Bauhaus literature is that the one traditional subject that had no place in the Bauhaus curriculum was history. This is quite important, lest we forget that the main means of teaching and learning in 19th century art schools, and this is especially the case with the French Beaux-Arts uh, historical tradition, was to have students visit local museums and studiously copy the masterworks on display there, or paint the nude collectively on the basis of our artistic training. This is kind of very typical models then of 19th century uh, art schools. While there were other arts and crafts schools around Europe before the First World War that challenged this model, the Bauhaus took their ideas the furthest. The rejection of history and academic tradition was perhaps the most radical element at the Bauhaus. Even other scandalously anti-traditional art movements such as Dadaism and Futurism never dispensed with history and instead used it to mock the present. The Bauhaus's 1921 teaching guideline for the basic course stated clearly that, quote, the young artist must strive for liberation from dead conventions. By 1928, the Bauhaus curriculum had expanded, including courses in psychology, sociology, even Marxism and Leninism, uh, but never history. This was part of the shock of the new, and the whole school built its identity on embracing the present by rejecting the past. That this attitude was particularly pronounced in Germany was no accident. The insistence on a complete break with the past was especially strong among the losers of the First World War, or those who felt cheated by the peace, such as Italy. And there was a strong sense that the Great War had forever changed the world and that cultural life needed to be changed with it. 
Gropius himself was severely injured during the First World War. At one point, he had been buried alive for three days and envisioned his design school as combating the dehumanizing effects of war-oriented industrial mechanization. As he put it in his 1925 book, New Architecture and the Bauhaus, were mechanization an end in itself, it would be an unmitigated calamity since, quote, stunting men and women into subhuman robot-like automatons would be a disaster. The 1920s were not just the golden age of design as radical social engineering. It was also a decade that desperately tried to turn away from the corrosive influence of history. The effort to throw out the past to discover either the deeper laws of nature the power of primary colors and shapes, or inner spirituality were all present in the early Bauhaus, especially in connection with Itten and Kandinsky, but to some extent with Josef Albers and Moholy Naj. Notable too is that at the Bauhaus, the geography of inspiration for starting over was generally not to look westward, but rather eastward, above all to the Russian Revolution. It was to Moscow that many of the Bauhaus teachers and designers turned for cues on how to build a material civilization from scratch. The Bauhaus's fascination with the young Soviet Union was downplayed during the Cold War in an effort to show that the Bauhaus was a bridge of transatlantic modernism to the United States. Yet the cultural interest at the time tended to be oriented eastward. Needless to say, the preoccupation was starting over after the Great War was hardly a Bauhaus monopoly. Le Corbusier's famous dictum of 1925, architecture or revolution, was really one of architecture as revolution, one in which the whole material world, from the spoon to the city, as the old 1914 Werkbund phrase had it, became the field of design and redesign. But in this heady atmosphere of building new material worlds, history apparently had little to teach or at least modern history. The recent Guggenheim exhibition on the Albers in Mexico, I'm sure some of you have seen this, underlines the point of how leading Bauhaus figures prefer to look to ancient civilizations for inspiration, less toward recent history. Later, observers and design historians worked to place the Bauhaus in the context of the Shaker, Biedermeier, and Werkbund legacies, but this historical impulse typically came after the end of the Second World War, with a few exceptions, uh, as I'll show you. This anti-historical attitude is manifest in other ways, too. Frank Lloyd Wright repeatedly voiced his strong dismay toward the takeaway message of the first major Bauhaus exhibition in America, Bauhaus 1919 and 1928, organized at the moment in 1938 by the then young curator Alfred Barr, Jr. And this is the uh, cover uh, image from it. This MoMA show was a kind of response to the third highest scandalous degenerate art uh, exhibition mounted a year before. Remember, that was 1937. This is 1938. In part to make clear that German modernism, including Bauhaus modernism, may, not, may have been ridiculed and repressed in Nazi Germany, but it had been successfully transplanted to American shores for safekeeping. By the same token, the 1938 MoMA show, in some measure, undid the message from Nicholas Pevsner's Pioneers of Modern Design, published uh, two years before in 1936, which was the first scholarly effort to situate the Bauhaus in the history of design and to put Gropius and his school in a kind of family tree that included Ruskin, Morris, Van der Velde, and Peter Behrens. For what bothered Wright about the 1938 New York show, and he was hardly alone, was the bold suggestion that the Bauhaus had brought modernism to America, implying that there was no modern architectural tradition in America before the arrival of the Bauhaus emigres. In my research at the Bauhaus archive in Berlin back in the early 90s, I discovered a testy exchange of letters between the American architectural historian Vincent Scully um, and Gropius in 1962, one in which Scully voiced his anger about the way that Gropius and his Bauhaus missionaries marginalized Wright's influence on European modernism. After all, Gropius had written to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright back in 1912, saying that Wright was the great inspiration for his work and for many other Europeans of his generation. 
Gropius' Sommer, uh, Sommerfeld House, which he built in 1921, is clearly an homage to Wright's prairie school style. In the 1920s and 30s, many Central European architects visited the US to marvel at what they saw as the great emblems of the coming industrial age, Midwestern grain silos, Ford's assembly line at River Rouge, um, as well as Sullivan and Wright's Chicago work, and of course, uh, Manhattan skyscrapers. A fascination chronicled in Rainer Banham's 1986 classic book on concrete Atlantis, which some of you probably know. Tom Wolfe's 1981 From Bauhaus to Our House reheated this right Gropius rivalry as Wolfe lamented the ways in which the Bauhaus still dominated American material life at the expense of the country's homegrown uh, modernist vernacular. That Gropius had marginalized right as the, and the American contribution to the history of industrial modernism was not the only sleight of hand in this 1938 show. The exhibition also completely expunged the key Bauhaus presence of Hannes Meyer. And I think Dara Kiesa will be talking about this tomorrow. Uh, Hannes Meyer was a Swiss communist architect who succeeded Gropius. Oops, I have an image of him, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as Bauhaus director in 1928, and who arguably oversaw the school's most productive period. Meyer instituted a more leftist program based on what he called the needs of the people instead of luxury needs and brought the school in closer contact with the trade unions and the workers' movement. The school's early leftist beginnings, as well as Gropius's 1922 monument to nine workers killed in the right-wing Kaputsch of 1920, this is Gropius's design, quite uh, avant-garde for 1922, and Mises' 1926 monument to the murdered communists uh, Karl Liebknecht and Loza Rux, uh, Loza Rux, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, this is here, were, went unmentioned in the 1938 show and most subsequent post-1945 accounts. This kind of story, the leftist beginning of Bauhaus was essentially completely washed out uh, during the Cold War. Once he arrived in the US in 1937, Gropius worked assiduously to scrub Bauhaus history of any unsavory elements to help transplant its ideas to Cold War America and particularly to Harvard's GSD. That Gropius returned to Germany in 1947 in American army uniform as General Lucius Clay's official architectural advisor did much to win over American skeptics about the suspect foreignness of this emigre design style. By the late 1950s, Gropius had become a legendary international figure, subject to embarrassingly hagiographic biographies about his vision and iron will to bring modernism to the masses. The sanitized liberal version of Bauhaus history culminated in the, in the 50th anniversary retrospective in Stuttgart in 1968 called uh, 50 Years Bauhaus. And this is a cover designed by Habit Baya, whose opening coincided with radical student agitation in Paris and West Germany about university restructuring and social reform. Some of the old Bauhaus standard bearers, such as Josef Albers, uh, Mies van der Rohe, and Marcel Breuer, were sidelined in the 1968 show in an effort to equate the Bauhaus with Gropius's biography. Hannes Meyer was ignored altogether. Even so, the stage-managed opening also witnessed a real clash of different understandings of the Bauhaus. When the radical students of the Ulm School of Design, remember the Ulm School was founded as a new Bauhaus in 1951 and was now facing closure by the regional government in Baden-Württemberg for its radicalism. So when the radical students of the Ulm School came to the exhibition opening to protest about the need to better align design and politics, Gropius, who was at this point almost 90 years old, happened to be present Amid the demonstrations, Gropius took a megaphone, I think there's a picture of this, took a megaphone and implored the students to stay quiet and keep politics out of the design school. To the consternation of the Ulm students who felt that they were best honoring Bauhaus tradition by not bowing to state or commercial pressures. The story is not just about how Gropius carefully controlled the legacy of the Bauhaus after its Berlin closure in 1933, to my mind, the 1968 Stuttgart confrontation reveals a larger issue. 
that there was never just one Bauhaus, but many. By this, I don't just mean the story of famous transplants, be it at the Black Mountain College in North Carolina, Harvard, Chicago, Ulm, or at various design schools in the former uh, East, uh, 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 Republic of East Germany. Rather, the sense of plurality could be seen within the original German Bauhaus itself. The difference between the Itten dominated Weimar Bauhaus and the more Moholy Nagy influenced period in Dessau with his more direct embrace of industrial technology, including photography, was plain to all. There was also Cold War variations too. In 1950s West Germany, it was the Bauhaus painters and not the architects or designers such as Paul Klee, Josef Albers, and Kandinsky above all, who were seen as most representative of the school's creative spirit. While in socialist East Germany, the leftist architects and designers, not surprisingly, <coughs> Hannes Meyer, were hailed as the key Bauhaus figures. In any case, it is one of the longest lasting and most misleading fables of Bauhaus history that the school was a singular entity. And for this, Gropius, along with his loyal publicists, including architectural historians Siegfried Gideon and Han Hans Maria uh, Wingler, as well as Gropius's biographer Reginald Isaacs, were most responsible. Dispensing with the myth of singularity and unity is a first step in understanding Bauhaus history in all its diversity. Now, at this point, I'd like to shift gears by focusing on one particular Bauhaus figure, namely Wilhelm Wagenfeld, arguably Germany's most famous industrial designer of the 20th century. I want to do this because it gives some sense of the complicated political and moral history behind the Bauhaus. Now, Wagenfeld's work is no doubt familiar to you, while other design figures like Hermann Gretsch or Marcel Breuer were extremely influential. No one exerted as much influence over the century, both inside and outside German, German design circles and beyond as Wagenfeld. And this is a picture Wagenfeld there in his um, atelier in the 1950s. Oh, yeah, 54. Uh, Wagenfeld was trained at the Bauhaus in the 1920s and eventually taught there in the industrial design department. He had been a Wachmund member his whole professional life and enjoyed a remarkably prolific design career over six decades. His design palette was unusually varied, ranging from glassware to cutlery to lamps to radio design. Wagenfeld's name remains closely associated with the design firms of WMF, Weisswasser, and Jena Glassworks, although he designed for a number of smaller firms as well. Shown here are a few of the best known design products, beginning with his 1924 Bauhaus lamp to his 30s metalwork. And I'm just going to run through some of these kind of things I'm sure you've seen many times before. Glassware's crockery through the 1950s, glass design for BMF. Um, it's kind of work. This is going to work from the 1930s. Again, many, many of these are still in production. Uh, glassware, again, you can see right through the 1930s. And this is some work from the 1950s. Uh, we have those salt and pepper shakers at home. Uh, remember, <laughs> pointing to my daughter who probably recognizes this from her childhood trauma. Who knows? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, here's some glasswork he had done. Um, okay. Wagenfeld was a committed social democrat. His whole life was one of three Wachbund members to vote against the Wachbund's takeover by Schulte Namburg's Kampfbund in 1933 and published dozens of essays on the ethical imperative of good design in the 1940s and 50s. Now, looking at some of these classic Wagenfeld products, it, it is hard not to see how his work neatly mirrored, mirrored sorry, the larger tenets of 20th century German industrial design. Indeed, his own biography perfectly reflected the Bauhaus's initial fascination with, and later rejection of, expressionism after World War I. Here are a few forgotten woodcuts that Wagenfeld executed on the expressionist themes of pain, death, waiting, work, and even Christian redemption before he arrived at the Bauhaus in 1923. So this is one on pain. This is not, not the sharpest of image. These kind of woodcuts. Um, again, this image of uh, you know, death in the Madonna. Uh, death again, the right, against the kind of backdrop of uh, the metropolis, almost like a Weimar film set. Um, and this one again, but the, the kind of theme of waiting in a sense from a world that has collapsed to waiting for another one to come. And there's kind of images of, of men at work. Uh, 
I think well, I'll, I'll, that's, I'll get to that one in a second. Like many of his generation, he saw the legacy of the Great War, and he was too young to fight in it himself, as one of mass death, catastrophe, hope, and long for renewal. And his woodcuts echoed some of the, some of the great um, some of the uh, woodcuts of some of the great German sculptor Katie Kovitz. I show you these images not only to provide a slightly different view of Wagenfeld, the uh, well-known industrial designer, but also to suggest that the interest in the metaphysical and even spiritual dimension of objects and the built environment animated much of German industrial modernism. What is so interesting is the way that Wagenfeld's work became emblematic of 20th century design in general. After all, his design wares were embraced as a positive expression of a new and progressive German modernity by each German political regime from the Weimar Republic onward. During the interwar years, Wagenfeld's design was sold and displayed in, in exhibitions as the fruit of the New Republic's felicitous marriage of social democracy and mass production, the very embodiment of a modern and socially responsible urban living. His design output was later central to West Germany's rehabilitation of Weimar modernism after 1945 as its true cultural patrimony one that sought to bridge the 1920s and 1950s in an elective liberal lineage. Wagenfeld's wares were prominently displayed in West German cultural shows, trade fairs, and most notably in the West German pavilion at the 1958 uh, World Exhibition in Brussels. Wagenfeld's written work, in particular his 1948 collection of essays, Wesen und Gestalt der Dinge um uns, or uh, Essence and Shape of the Things Around Us, was the touchstone text of virtually every West German design school after 1945. What is often overlooked is that Wagenfeld's importance was equally discernible in East Germany as well, despite the cultural pressures of the Cold War. His book was the one most taught in East German design schools, and his work was also prominently featured in East German design shows, publications, and design journals from the 1950s onward. In fact, until the wall was built in 1961, Wagenfeld traveled back and forth between West and East German design firms um, developing his product designs. One would be hard pressed to find another cultural branch during the Cold War that displayed this kind of East-West openness, goodwill, and even common cause, in part because design was seen as comparatively less political. No less significant is that Wagenfeld's work was also hailed in the Third Reich's des uh, key design shows and international exhibitions. For example, his goods were displayed at the German pavilion of the 1933 Century of Progress show in Chicago, the Milan Triennale in 1937, 1940, and at the 1937 World Exhibition in Paris as the best of Nazi modernity. He was subject to a special 1939 show at Munich's pro-modern Die Neue Sammlung Museum, and his modernist designs were awarded the gold medal at the uh, Paris World's Fair and the prestigious Grand Prix of the 1940 Milan Triennale. Despite the Nazi takeover in 1933, he was consistently given great latitude to pursue his design and written work, regardless of his Bauhaus training and well-known left-wing views. In a 1960 letter to his longtime friend and former Bauhaus colleague, Walter Gropius, Wagenfeld even went so far as to say that he never enjoyed as much artistic freedom as he did at the Weisswasser factory under Nazi rule. But the larger question is why such modern design was embraced by each 20th century German regime, despite radically different political outlooks and ideologies. Now, one obvious answer is economics. All of these regimes recognize the importance of these Bauhaus-inspired design goods for the potential economic windfall, particularly in terms of export value. This was certainly the case during the Weimar Republic and was even more pronounced during the, the post-1945 period as both West and East Germany understood early on the benefit of these objects for economic recovery. The same went for the Third Reich, which did not want to jeopardize lucrative export markets and international goodwill associated with modern design. Consider the example of uh, Hosh um, wallpaper, which advertised and sold Bauhaus designs in its, uh, with its name through the 1930s. So even the Bauhaus itself had been officially closed in 1933. Uh, there's a company that's producing wallpaper in 1937, clearly and conspicuously 
with the Bauhaus name. So it may have been closed as a school, but it's not to say its name was in any way taboo. Secondly, design was seemingly more apolitical than other fields. Small things designed for the home, as opposed to large buildings or murals designed for public spaces, appeared less charged with political ideology, or at least their political meaning was construed in ways that could sustain more continuity over regime changes. A revealing indication of this was the frequency with which design booklets and home decoration guides produced in the 30s were simply reprinted after 1945 in both West and East Germany as essential sources of guidance and cultural counsel. Such continuities in German modernism from the 20s through the 1960s would be hard to imagine in other cultural branches. It then comes as no real surprise that this strange story of continuity has become a kind of master narrative of German design over the century. It is a tale of the stubborn triumph of hard-headed German functionalism, one that connects the Werkbund, the Bauhaus, and the Ulm School of Design in a tradition of national achievement. This is not to say that there weren't non or anti-functionalist design styles in Germany too. Jugendstil, for example, and other sundry organic design waves came and went uh, over the course of the century, but few found their way into the country's major industrial design exhibitions, design books, or cultural histories. Instead, most design literature still tends to describe Germany as what one German design historian calls the nation of functionalism, whatever that means. Um, what I find, what I find so striking, and this is something that is rarely addressed, is that the story of German design continuity stands in stark contrast to the world of 20th century German politics. For whatever we may say about it, Germany's 20th century was hardly one of unchanging continuity. On the contrary, Germany was a volatile construction site for radical political ventures of all stripes, so much so that it was one of the few countries to experience every form of modern political government. Started the century a constitutional monarchy, democratic socialism, fascism, Western-style liberalism, and Soviet-style communism in the compressed 20th century. Yet it was precisely in the midst of this period of dizzying political upheaval, shifting national fortunes, and dramatic regime changes when German industrial design essentially stayed the same. That design was associated with stability and continuity, arguably the only field of German cultural life that was goes some way in explaining its unique place in German cultural politics over the decades. So whereas much of design history is construed as a kind of family tree of influences and innovations, yeah. we should also note that stasis and changelessness also have a history. A related issue is cultural memory. While there was certainly a strain of functionalist design that prided itself on its anti-traditionalism, remember the Bauhaus famously didn't teach any history courses, there was also a sense of long cultural continuity in design too. Indeed, a good deal of this ideology derived from the concept of what used to be called ewige form or eternal form. Now listeners would be forgiven for suspecting that this eternal form concept was a crude Nazi invention one that supposedly went hand in hand with the idea of the thousand year Reich and its obsession with immortality. But the idea of eternal form was really invented during the late Weimar Republic. Specifically it comes from a 1930 Werkbund show at Munich's Die Neue Sammlung, or the new collection of the same name, what the exhibition was called Ewige Form, in which the pro-modernist curator uh, Wolfgang von Wietzin, in an effort to counter charges of modernism's non-German traditionless origins work to show that modernism was in fact natural, was in fact the natural and legitimate heir to classical culture. In other words, it's an eternal form. The result was that this particular ideology actually bridged the Weimar and Nazi periods. Nowhere was this plainer than the work of the modernist painter, sculptor, designer, and publicist Walter Dexel. Dexel's probably most famous a little book that he co-wrote with his wife Greta in 1928 called uh, Die Wohnung von Heute, which is the dwelling of today uh, from 1928, in which he lavished praise on the modern masters, including Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, and Bruno Taut as the best in contemporary domestic design. But the search for modernism's historic roots became more prominent in his writings in the 1930s. In his 1938 book, Hausgerät des Nichtveraltet, or 
housewares which don't age, for example, Dexel advanced the argument that while elite tastes uh, dramatically changed over the century, and 19th century historicism was, special, was a subject of special scorn for him, the everyday material culture of ordinary people, and his term was Volkskultur, remained essentially unchanged. To prove this, he provided visual evidence of, of um, such similarity in glass and cutlery design over the centuries, as noted in these figures. So in a sense, he's arguing that uh, here's you know, 18th century, 17th century, that, that you know, uh, the things we use, use every day, the cutlery has changed actually not, not very much over centuries. And the Renaissance is kind of the beginning of his story. I think I have another image, yeah. Notably, Dexel finished his book by praising the Third Reich's effort to bring modernism to people in everyday spaces, including the so-called beauty of labor, factory canteens, strength through joy, uh, cruise liners, and factory homes. So in a sense, he looks at these kind of images of the culmination of this particular style. The work of designer Hermann Gretsch was singled out as a key instance of this timeless modernism, though Wagenfeld's design was read in a similar way too. This is Gretsch's work. And especially the way it's photographed, right? Just like these, uh, these backgrounds that remove history and context altogether, this line of work. And Gretsch was a kind of favorite uh, designer from the 30s um, right to the 40s. I think I have one more of these, that's right. So design thus retained the utopian dimension in this regard to the extent that it augured a world of rationality, stability, and comfort that had little corresponding expression in concrete re reality for most Germans in the first half of the last century. And yet it was all the more powerful exactly because of its very possibility, its foretaste of a better world to come. In the end, it was precisely these commonplace things that proved so important in remaking lives and dreams after 1945, if not before. Now at this point, I'd like to return to Wagenfeld and in particular to another letter he wrote to Gropius in 1964. In it, Wagenfeld wrote that he felt guilty about not doing more to resist the Nazis. He was an opponent of Nazism from the beginning and confessed to Gropius that he and a friend had actually plotted to assassinate Hitler and Ludendorff when the two political figures took part in a march in Weimar in 1925. At the last second, they recoiled from carrying it out and Wagenfeld expressed lifelong regret for not having committed an act that would have prevented the Second World War. During the war, he refused to serve in the German army and declared and was declared a political parasite, but eventually was rounded up and sent to the Eastern Front in 1943. Wagenfeld recounted that after a few months there, he openly declared before his whole battalion his shame of being German, yet was not punished or killed, largely thanks to his close friendship with the commanding officer. He spent the end of the war in a Russian POW camp. In his letter to Gropius, he wrote that he, quote, felt guilty for all the dead in this war who fell in Europe because of his decision not to assassinate Hitler when he had had the chance. What I find especially revealing is his next paragraph on the perceived connection between design, anti-militarism, and moral regeneration. As he put it, quote, I refuse any cooperation with the military and have petitioned against nuclear armament and the creation of a West German army. In my design work, I am doing everything I can to make people's interactions with their surrounding objects as joyful as possible, and that the people who use these things, whether workers in the factories or people in their home, will in turn be more engaged and aware in their daily life and thought." End quote. Design was thus both his atonement and personal contribution to building a better post-fascist world. While such idealism was hardly new or limited to Wagenfeld, the legacy of political defeat and moral catastrophe, I would argue, lent this old idealistic rhetoric a heightened and perhaps distinctly German intensity. For whatever else we may say about it, Germany served as the most dramatic testing ground for design's close collaboration with politics and social reconstruction. In our era, such sentiment may seem very much the past, confirming the extent to which the, the 20th century, perhaps thankfully, has um, become history. Wagenfeld's design stands as witnesses to this belief, in a sense, residues of an idealized world that never quite came about, but also as reminders of a material world that did. German modernism, infused with the dreams of social engineering of all kinds, both benign and evil, 
remains emblematic of the dreams and delusions that informed this 20th century will to design. Wagenfeld's story shows how Bauhaus history has become its own version of eternal form with too little sense of its history or historical change. Now, in my last section, um, I'd like to reverse direction at this point, if I may, and talk about a few other aspects of the Bauhaus legacy that are not usually discussed and that may help explain the evergreen quality uh, 100 years on. The first is the idea of small is beautiful. As noted before, the smallness of Bauhaus objects, tea kettles, chess sets, chairs, allowed its designers to revolutionize the common coin of everyday life without the same political scrutiny to other more highly charged cultural domains, such as painting and architecture. Small in this case, therefore, meant less political. The second dimension of small is beautiful is the generally overlooked fact that the greatest design schools of the 20th century, Weimar, Dezau, Black Mountain, Cranbrook, and Ulm, were all founded in small or mid-sized towns. This was a full reversal from the 19th century model of premier art academies created in national capitals. Remember, of course, the, the uh, Paris Beaux-Arts uh, School, especially in Europe. In the 20th century, the opposite was often the case. It was in relatively isolated settings that the vision of designing a new community around a whole mode of alternative living, one that encompassed farming, schooling, music making, common meals, and building projects took root in a kind of anti-urban retreat of communal experimentation, far from the allures and noise of the large metropolis. This 20th century effort to build removed design retreats does not seem to have survived the, uh, into the 21st century, as design activity seems again to be concentrated in major urban centers, though of course Cupertino uh, may be a possible exception. Um, Another dimension of the Bauhaus's evergreen quality is the evident display of fraternity. By now, we're all familiar with the photos of Bauhaus students posing for the camera, dressed in costume for weekly balls, organizing lantern festivals, playing jazz, and generally clowning around the school and in town. By contrast, most of the images of the Beaux-Arts Academies in the 19th century, remember the one that I had shown you before, um, especially in Central Europe, are usually stiff, serious representations of young artists at work. Some of the images of 19th century French Beaux-Arts students were more relaxed, as we saw in some of the earlier slides. But this is still a far cry from the self-representation of Bauhaus students smoking, dressing up, um, dancing, and behaving in frivolous ways. I'm just going to run through a sample of some of these. This is a uh, jazz band. Uh, this is the, uh, some of the people from the uh, weaving workshop, that kind of famous stairwell immortalized by Oscar uh, uh, Schlemmer in that painting. Uh, again, this weaving workshop in 1926, these kind of photos, Luke's finding out. I like this in particular because you get kind of a mix of faculty and students. That's Josef Albers on the bottom right, which unusually kind of frivolous moment. If you see him, he's usually very buttoned up, usually with his tie. Uh, this is actually giving you this feeling of just uh, the kind of informality and the kind of bohemian dimension that they're kind of pouring through this, uh, this door. To be sure, the Bauhaus body culture was part of the effort to break, to break from tradition, celebrate youthful exuberance, and to introduce more informality in teaching and, and school life, which includes a more relaxed relationship uh, between faculty and students. Still, these common images of fraternity and frivolity are one of the things that mark out the Bauhaus from other design schools, and arguably, to me, echo the Renaissance invention of youthful friendship as a new painterly subject of the times um, is seen in these images. Uh, there was an exhibition in London a couple years ago about the kind of images of fraternity, friendship, brotherhood in Renaissance paintings. It's just another one. That a design school would focus on youth is hardly noteworthy. What made the Bauhaus unique at the time was its employment of remarkably young teachers. Uh, Maholi Naj was only 28 when he was appointed, and students turned masters Herbert Bayer, Gunther Stolzer, and Marcel Breuer were also in their 20s when they became Bauhaus teachers, while Marina Brandt, Josef Albers were only in their early, uh, early 30s. These images of an informality between staff and students was also a hallmark of Bauhaus life. Of course, what happened was that Bauhaus forms, despite their strong efforts to avoid this, eventually congealed into an identifiable style 
and formless convention, a kind of, for some, forerunner of IKEA. <laughs> um, Knoll, Vitsu, and, Vitso, and other companies have long traded on this kind of good form style for their own market niche, of course, to great success. Uh, I like uh, a lot of that work. Um, West Germany's Ulm School design as the as they designated heir to the Dezau Bauhaus leveled the most trenchant critiques of the way that the Bauhaus's functionalist anti-style actually had become just another commodity style like any other. This is why they, led by the Argentine-born um, Italian designer, Professor Thomas Maldonado, strove to move the focus of design from hardware to software as the real site of social change. In their case, in the early 60s, this meant cybernetics and systems design, which is one of the real innovations of the Ulm School to think differently about design as not just product design, but actually designing essentially what we now would call software. Arguably, Silicon Valley software designers may be the real heirs to the Bauhaus legacy with all of the dangers of standardization and the assault on privacy that this prescriptive functional design already represented back in the 1920s. The link between Apple and the Bauhaus was suggested by Apple co-founder Steve Jobs in a speech in 1983 when he remarked, quote, the new design should take the Bauhaus as its starting point and relate more to the object's functionality and true character. In the 1920s, glass was the utopian material of choice in the name of light, hygiene, transparency, and even socialism. Since glass was considered a material of equality and community in a world in which the haves would not need to hide away their wealth from the have-nots through thick walls, gates, and curtains. Even if plastics were later celebrated as the material of Eastern European socialism in the 50s and 60s, the legacy of the interwar's generation's romance with glass had effectively bequeathed a world both of transparency and surveillance. 100 years on, we can still see the Bauhaus influence uh, everywhere, and now I'm moving to my very conclusion, you'll be happy to hear. Uh, most notably in architecture, industrial design, and graphic design. It arose from a culture moment where simplicity standards and anti-ornamentation were in vogue in many fields, including law, as noted in Daniel Domla's uh, recent book on Bauhaus laws. It was kind of interesting reading of, that the Bauhaus is actually part of a much larger movement in Central Europe to, in the name of kind of transparency and simplicity. Such utopianism was born of war and defeat, where tradition, heritage, and the old Victorian world seemed gone for good, with the Russian Revolution as the shimmering harbinger of a world to come. What distinguished the Bauhaus at the time was the effort to consider all material things as possible design tasks in ways only dimly imagined in the late 19th century and driven by a desire to find beauty and utility in the common stuff of modern industrial life. As the recent exhibition on Annie Albers as the consummate Bauhaus designer made clear. Many of these efforts were suffused with a vaguely Marxist idea about how the material world shapes consciousness and that the redesign of everyday life could lift and edify modern existence. This brings me to my very final point, which is that the Bauhaus very much marked out the dreams and disappointments of not just modernism, but the 20th century itself. It may have originated in a spirit of social democracy, but it also demonstrated how easily aesthetic forms could be used and manipulated by political projects spanning socialism to fascism, liberalism to communism, as Wagenfeld's career attests. The Bauhaus's dream of social engineering may not have survived the 20th century, yet its material forms have. What the Bauhaus legacy will be for the 21st century is, of course, anybody's guess. But one thing is clear, it has become history. And its impulse to reject tradition has long become a tradition in itself. This was inevitable, but it behooves us to think harder about the Bauhaus's many legacies so as to better understand our recent past and to help point the way to the coming decades. The past is still strange, shocking, and unfinished. And the best way to come to grips with Bauhaus history is to recall its unsettled and unsettling elements as a central part of our cultural inheritance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for that really fascinating talk. Um, we definitely have time for questions, and um, I will sit down. Okay. <laughs>
Yes, please. What is the relative cost of a Wagenfeld teapot? As <laughs> Just another one you would find in a shop, an ordinary one. Uh, when? You mean uh, like in, the 30s. in the 30s? In the 30s. More than the average teapot, you find yes, the same so pot. It's not, it's not, not exorbitantly expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, if you look at the high design in the 1950s, people are designing for brawn, for example. Those, those, a brawn photograph costs 600 D marks in 1950. I mean, an enormous sum that only the, the kind of elites could buy. The Augenfeld stuff was aimed at the mass market. It was priced higher than that for production. Uh, it was never quite as mass produced as, the, um, as people have said. But it was never, it was, you know, it was in a sense more of a um, sort of design associated with a particular kind of person. But it's not to say price was beyond the reach of many people. Um, so I, would, I guess that's not really the answer. But the answer I would say is that. It was more expensive than average things you could find at any department store, but not beyond the price of many middle class consumers. So, they, in other words, they were not as elitist as they may look. In the Especially in the 1930s, a lot of these uh, the objects under the Nazi regime were subsidized. Uh, so, they probably were at its cheapest uh, during the third auction. Actually, it was probably a period in which, ironically, it enjoyed its most popular appeal. Uh, again, I mean, Wagenfeld was quite good about uh, drawing attention to the contradictions. Again, not only are just free, but with the, with the uh, uh, subsidies of pricing, obviously one in which actually he was getting a much broader audience for his designs. Please. Um, two questions. One, um, how was the Bauhaus funded from its early days to 33? Through tuition or... Who was, who was underwriting the Bauhaus in terms of its cost? It's obviously an institution with people getting appointments, buildings, etc. And the second question is, wasn't there a book in the mid-80s about the Bauhaus's connection to uh, Nazi Germany? Uh, the second question, yes, there was a, um, Elaine Hoffman's biography of Mies van der Rohe uh, was one in which kind of opened up this idea of the connections between him and the Nazi regime. Um, that's the one book. There was a big discussion in, in West Germany in the 1980s, starting with, in a sense, how to reassess the historical board's action chair, and then think about Nazi models, and in any sense, some minor Nazi architects who actually stayed in Germany to do a lot of industrial uh, design work. So that was one issue. Second question about uh, patronage. Um, the Bauhaus was funded by municipal governments. So in a sense, they had a very powerful and friendly mayor uh, in Weimar early on. And then with uh, when Weimar moved to the right, uh, that's when things became more difficult for them to work. Based on they moved then from Weimar to Dessau. And then the same situation happened there. They had a very um, uh, important uh, mayor there in Dessau. And then that turned more difficult to than they essentially in Berlin for the original period. So one of the things that's an important story, which doesn't get played up enough, is the, the power and presence in the Weimar Republic of very uh, far um, sighted mayors uh, that had a particular eye. Uh, one is against the backdrop of the huge housing crisis, so they need a lot of designers and architects in the 1920s. Uh, the ones in which they had a particular commitment to models. Um, so that became, I guess, on some level, a repeat of the 1960s. You had a number of around the world and states and mayors that also trying to, in light of housing crisis, to uh, develop new. Modernist forms, but not with the same kind of audience or kind of style and durability that it was in 1920. So um, that's one of the kind of forgotten elements is the story of patronage and a number of enlightened mayors that were actually making these design schools possible. Uh, do you want me to call? I'm <laughs> okay, uh, here in the back, I think. I don't know what order. Yeah, please. Hi. Uh, beginning with your talk, you mentioned a number of submissions during the Nazi regime by Bauhaus architects for projects, and maybe one of the reasons that's so surprising is if the Nazis closed down the Bauhaus, we might think of their architects and teachers as maybe that blacklisted. So I'm curious if any of those works were actually built, and if not, do we suspect that their rejection might have had something to do with whom they were, or their supposed political ideologies, or were they really just not winners, period? Not winners. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the things that, that first that cover of the book I showed you, that conference that I was talking with 1991 about, uh, a number of the 
I guess you call the kind of mal, the minor Bauhaus architects and designers. A number of them stay in Germany, and none of them do a lot of work with the Nazis in terms of designing uh, uh, airports, you know, uh, uh, big industrial structures, the locomotives, trains. That, that continues to be weaponry tanks. Um, some of them are most deadly with that. They often will not sign their work. They kind of deal with the regime as it's you know, especially they feel that that particular, uh, that their power association is politically incorrect and they do more anonymous design. But it depends on the, on the, on the firm, it, it depends on the region, but there's certainly a good amount of hours present during the Third Reich. That was something that was absolutely brushed in the department for decades. Many people knew it. We talk about it very much, and it's really that conference in 1991 when this started to surface. I have the kind of high profile moments with Grove Beast Me Spander on the Habit Bio, but since that's more interesting on the number of the students uh, who actually stayed and got work. But I mean, architects and designers like other branches so chase <laughs> projects and commissions, right? So that's, you know, again, especially early on, it was unclear which way this regime would go. Uh, I don't want to say this in turn that there's somehow Nazi sympathizers, but certainly the work was going on. And Wagenfeld's actually kind of an interesting case because he really, really is morally tortured about this because he enjoyed actually, in many ways, the most prolific part of his career was during a regime that he detested and they gave him such latitude um, that it was later actually a pains to look back on that sense of freedom and what that actually meant. So uh, this letter you have with Gropius in 64, I think, is getting at this particular problem, but I haven't seen anything like that from any other Bauhaus architect in terms of their their kind of tortured moral conscience in terms of what it meant to have stayed in Germany and continued working. I mean, some were buttholed, some, you know, stayed and could not work. Uh, others found ways of working, and Rockefeller was probably the most prolific of all, uh, and justified in his own way, and later found it very difficult to look back on his, uh, what probably was the height of his career. Yes, please, the back. Yeah, um, I sometimes have a problem with the concept of the brand of the Bauhaus. In this sense, there's an uh, old story about the five uh, Chinese blind men who are asked to describe an elephant. And they all come back with a different description of the same thing. Could you talk a little bit about the idea of uh, when, when a, a, a normal uh, citizen of, of Germany thinks of the Bauhaus, what object comes to mind? In other words, you know, in terms of a, of a, of a brand, uh, you think Bauhaus, you think of this object. You mean it's today? Or you mean back then, in terms of establishing the, the brand, you know, in a sense of, of, of different people seeing it in different ways, like the blind men and the elephant. Well, certainly for its political enemies, uh, the, you know, this idea that they were cultural Bolsheviks, it was the flat roof and <laughs> unadorned surfaces. The fact that it was kind of, that the, that, you know, the facades of a building had been cleansed of any historical references. It was uh, using also very modern materials, you know, uh, steel, glass, concrete. Yeah, but the, 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 the squared off roofs, it was a constant sense that this is an alien form which doesn't belong in Germany. And this is, uh, this is international socialism. It's something that is, is wrong here. And they were constantly mocking that it may be, you know, you should build this, this style in sunny areas, that, you know, in the Middle East and elsewhere. It doesn't belong here in Germany. It just suggests the whole thing is an alien form and this is an alien invasion uh, from, from, uh, from elsewhere. And the fact that the Bible had a lot of foreign teachers, especially a lot of people from uh, Russia, so even like Kandinsky was all of a sudden suggested that this is something that's not homegrown. Um, but the, so in that way, the I would say the kind of rectangular roofing was probably more than anything else than the symbol of Bob's modernism. Also, it's kind of large, you know, these housing projects, though well, they were designed by lots of other people, that became a kind of symbol of uh, Bob's, this kind of uh, small squat, uh, kind of functional uh, design pieces. You know, some of the Bob felt. Uh, Cutlery, the kind of black, uh, the, the uh, lamps, and somehow all these things that have been that are hyper industrialized that look too much that are coming off the factory and not enough one that would signal the division between public and private. In other words, where your home looks and your factory looks, Bauhaus in a sense blurring that distinction, a kind of mechanized industrial look uh, for many, many traditional and conservative Germans. This was in a sense um, very, very unwelcome and un I guess yeah. Uh, I so I used to think the Bauhaus is just like a you know brand or design or architecture, but I 
started to think um, well, by attending several you know, lectures and like reading about I started to think that more like a um, art school and community of artists who happen to produce products and I think um, most lectures, Bahamas lectures, like mentioned that the school only lasted for 14 years and but there are like, you know, there's like a Bauhaus University in Weimar, they are still doing Bauhaus and like an institute, institute of Design in Chicago, they are still doing somehow in Bauhaus, it started by, you know, Mahori Nagi. So um, I'm just like wondering, I'm personally interested in, uh, I'm an educator myself and I'm personally interested in um, this core curriculum that they developed to educate um, artists and is it something you consider core of their idea of us? Or wait, what do you think about these other schools that they kind of studied? That uh, did they, they are not considered Bauhaus? I mean, like, what, 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 what's your ideas? Well, uh, I mean, that's just an important point I was trying to make, that there's, there's not one thing. The Bauhaus is not a singular entity. It's a kind of plurality. And it, it becomes kind of a diaspora story, not just just by having black in Germany, but many different Forms. I mean, the Black Mountain College is a very different place than the Chicago Bauhaus, which is very different from home, right? I'm just surprised that the people that are writing about the Bauhaus won't, in a sense, find a particular common denominator each time. And I think, actually, to me, the diversity of the story is a lot more interesting than, uh, than the actual uh, story of trying to corral it into something that's, that's singular and one thing. So. There is a Bauhaus brand. It's kind of thing that people associate with a set of canonical images, a few uh, objects and houses. But I, I think it's, in many ways, it's diffusion, which I find more compelling. And I, I just think it's what I guess I've done, if nothing else, tried to make a call or a plea for more history and more analysis in the sense of what happened after it closed. It's, you know, these are very different places. The kind of Americanization of Bauhaus is one particular aspect of it, but it is international, internationalized. And each time, though, it's kind of embedded in a particularly new setting. Um, and I think it starts to be a little bit slow to see, you know, what is new about that as opposed to saying that's just another transplant and uh, analyzing in terms of its original uh, Weimar Bauhaus vision. I think it's one in which we need to think a little harder about um, its further ramifications and think of its history as one that's a story of hundreds uh, because it moves uh, transnationally over decades it's not the same place. So you do have figures that kind of move around. I mean, Grobe, in a sense, consecrates the uh, Black Mountain College. He actually sends his niece there to study. Uh, and there's a kind of way in which he wants to have a certain kind of control there. I mean, Alberts is one of the teachers, but it's a very different place. And music is much more important than poetry. Of course, all the kind of Black Mountain poets, many of whom then move on to San Francisco and become part of the kind of Indian generation. There's also Sue and Robert Crew. I mean, that's a very different place. I think we need to account a little bit more uh, directly with the kind of the really, I think, very exciting, rich diversity of the of legacy, and not so much about uh, because it's, it's in a sense it's it's interesting globalization, which I think is the real story, not so much about um, uh, its origins. Yeah, please look out. Yeah. Uh, can you speculate about, so the gender politics of the Bauhaus are very bad and very well known. Uh, in terms of the, you know, huge numbers of women who were enrolled and were unable to actually be in the workshops they wanted to be in, and I was struck by the, you know, very young ages at which people were anointed masters, but uh, could you just speculate as to why there has been no Me Too Bauhaus movement? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there has. I mean, there have been a whole range of books written about women at the Bauhaus, Anya Baumhoff and a range of others, uh, to account for that, but it certainly took a long time. That's certainly true. I mean, there was there was a time there was a kind of cottage industry of some of the female Bauhaus designers, Annie Albers is a kind of an industry around her and others, uh, Maria, Marianne Pond, for example, but it's the idea of the kind of more collective experience of the Bauhaus. It's not a good story in that way. Uh, it's one of which, you know, Grope used to come in himself and say he was again taking money from uh, the municipal government. He had to please his patrons. He was slightly worried about this new design school, which would appear too feminized, in which the applicants were coming mostly from women. They had a majority of females. <coughs> uh, he supposed to have been about, in a sense, shunting all these women into the weaving workshop, but that in fact happened. But you have to remember that what happens they, after this foundation course, all the students then have to appear. 
uh, before a committee, and then they were assigned to their various departments, industrial design or the weaving workshop. So it wasn't just groupies, it was a collective of teachers, but they certainly did have a tendency uh, to push women in certain directions. There were famous instances of women who resisted that, said, I won't be assigned to the weaving workshop. I want Mariana Brown, for example. I want to go into the metal workshop or the industrial design workshop. And they were, oops, a few of them were allowed to go, but it's one in which it's been um, I don't know if it's quite a Me Too issue, but it's one in which it's it's been a kind of embarrassing, uh, I don't call it patriarchal, but certainly traditional element of, of Bauhaus historiography. But what's interesting is it was untouched for decades. That, that story wasn't picked up until the 1980s in terms of actually thinking about the female experience of Bauhaus. And you have a photograph. So I didn't talk about much today because I know we're going to be talking about this tomorrow. Elizabeth will be doing that in detail. Um, and it's been done as part of the centenary. Again, I think that's some of the most innovative work is trying to think about the kind of social life, the kind of bohemian aspect of it. But um, it is something that I think yes. finally is coming to the surface. And I think more work needs to be done in terms of not just the experience of, of female students in the past, but you know, what happened, what was it like to be a female Black Mountain College or at Ulm or these other ones? We don't have anything like that. It's always just about the German Bauhaus, but what actually happened to the diaspora Bauhaus is in terms of what like to be female there. That's still quite open. There's lots of Black Mountain work that's been done. Is there? Yes. Okay. Maybe you've done it yourself, have you? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like I said. I got my hand in the air. Yes, please. I, I yeah. Okay. Burning question to ask yes, you. Please. So I think this is actually really, really important. I want to just say as the whatever who I am, I, the, yeah. the facilitator, like I think this is a hugely important topic and I think it's one that we will get into tomorrow. I hope um, not ad nauseum, but I think that we will get into it a lot tomorrow. Um, but I wanted to actually ask you to talk a little bit about something that you talked about in your talk, yeah. which is this question of smallness. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that I found compelling about your work and also in this talk is the, the, the issue of um, this kind of argument about de design maintaining a certain profile across political regimes, right? Which is a really, I think, at least for me, a very interesting intersection of design and politics. Um, and I wonder, I mean, if I, you know, if I had to interpret that in terms of this idea, of this is sort of the small object that you're bringing up, this almost seems to me like a kind of a Trojan horse argument, you know, that there's a kind of a, it's, it's easy to sort of slip these things under the radar. And this is actually something that I've heard from Ben Friedman Erdinger as well. Um, and I'm wondering if you can push that at all, because I'm not, I mean, I feel as though, in one sense, it, it makes a lot of sense to me that the kind of overt political messages of, of two-dimensional artworks or monumental structures is, is more powerful in some sense because of scale or because of content, but I feel as though there's also a, a contemporaneous design reform movement in Germany that really emphasizes the power of small things even before the Bauhaus arrives and that there's a there's a sense especially in Germany maybe different from other places that those things have a lot of um, symbolic significance already and I'm just wondering if you've thought much about that uh, I mean you're right certainly the back point yeah and then there's certainly during the first world war they're talking quite a bit about redesigning coloring um, the last word. Uh, and that was seen as much more apolitical. So to me, there is, there is an issue of scale. Um, and that is something that kind of floats through. I don't imagine you could do a similar story in graphic design uh, in terms of lettering, in terms of how that seems to float across regimes and across decades. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, in terms of it seems to be one that, that popped out when I was doing the work on this, because as soon as you move the scale and the with the large paintings and the buildings, it seems to immediately take on the political valence. Maybe it's also an issue of storytelling. That seems to be when you're when you're painting most of the time, at least it has some narrative dimension mm -hmm. to it. Or building, at least there's some ornamental aspects to it. Or even if it's anti-ornamental, it's it's explicitly anti-ornamental. It's a kind of rejection of something people already know. Again, with the Daxel book, he's looking at let's say cutlery over centuries that hasn't mm -hmm. changed very much. It seems that even a small aesthetic or decorative variations don't have the political charge. Mm -hmm. As soon as you move into broader scales, uh, they seem to. But that's it's hard to pin that down in terms of whether people don't say that, but it's one in which it doesn't attract a lot of political discussion, debate, in the way that these other people do. Mm -hmm. So 
it's the smallness and also seems to be one in which the surfaces themselves have been washed clean of anything that seems to at least provoke uh, um, a kind of reaction that's either affirmation or rejection of a particular cultural tradition. When you're dealing with it, just kind of forks and knives, and that's it's a really, really kind of ornate source, and so it's not seen as something that's a, a necessary political statement. Um, also, because it's also in the same with cheaper design and that kind of functional style, so there seems to be an argument built in that this is uh, an argument of utility uh, and efficiency and economy, but not one necessary political statement. So it's, it depends on the objects, but for the most part, it seems to me that the smallness and everydayness have a less of a full charge than some of these other things, which seems much more similar <laughs> and more, um, more statement. Uh, yeah, please, in the back. Yeah. Sure. When I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, I was taught that our schools were so ugly and poorly built because of the Bauhaus. <laughs> <laughs> they were, in a sense, little factories for children to go into. And I um, remember my friend Max famously saying, every time I look at the cinder block walls, my soul dies a little bit more. <laughs> so there was this feeling that this was I think a horrible surrounding to grow up in. And I know that the colonnade buildings in New Jersey that were East Vandro buildings were considered one of the worst places that you could possibly live in New Jersey. And there's been an effort recently to try and um, revive and say, this is a Mies van der Rohe building. This is a very important part of our architectural history. And it's had moderate success. Do you see this changing in the future of there being more warmth toward in people's attitudes towards the Bauhaus architecture? Well, one thing I'm not, and kind of, I'm going to push this ironic position of defending the Bauhaus, but um, <laughs> that, I mean, that kind of thing that you're talking about, and I, I think all of us have experienced that, and you may already kind of vulgarized Bauhaus, and which is not really, it's not necessarily linked to what the Bauhaus had done. It, 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 it plays on the brand, uh, but it's not in any way, none of them would have signed on the project with that. There's a kind of 20s breakthrough, and there's a kind of, you want to call it, a kind of 60s popularization of that around the world. We all kind of recognize that it's going to figure that disfigured a lot of uh, international capitals uh, across the world in terms of and seen as all kind of uh, house modernism. Um, you go back to the original designs, I mean, you know, the care and the use of materials, that, that's quite different. I do think people now call it kind of neo modernism, this kind of return back to forgotten elements of the Kobisi and the Standard for contemporary architects. And actually, interested in going back to that particular uh, legacy in terms of the, the original breakthrough and some of the kind of care and loving detail. It's in a sense there, it's the generations, two generations after the Bauhaus that you know, take that message, popularize it, or vulgarize it, depending on how you see that, but, and that's associated with a particular brand. So by the time you get to, let's say, the kind of Vince Scully's and the others that are in Tom Wolfe's, all these thinking about it's exactly what you're saying, this is a, a, a particular movement that's, that's ruined uh, American vernacular style, to root it out completely. I'll go all the way back to see, in fact, you know, they, that's not, uh, those are not projects that they would have been happy to see or associate with themselves with, but for whatever reason, in the popular imagination, that's considered a Bauhaus moment. Right, the very back, please. I think I understood you to say, and I'm not sure, about halfway through, that a Bauhaus is considered an enemy of privacy, I uh, may be privacy issue. I was just trying to allude, did you want me to clarify that, you mean? Yes, I'm not sure what it meant. Uh, I just meant in the 1920s, this obsession with glass. Uh, that we see, this, it's always uh, somehow beneficial that it's a story of transparency. It does have this issue of, of you know, uh, surveillance with it. I mean, for example, the use of, there are a lot of discussions I've seen in East Germany, the use of glass, and a lot of glass. Uh, it's quite clear that a number of citizens were very suspicious about the use of glass, and they would often insist on their curtains, uh, because they really felt that they were designed in a way that they were looking in and watching their lives too often, so for them, it's a kind of story of the sociology of curtains, right? I mean, when do curtains matter? I mean, uh, and this is one in which, in regimes, whether or not uh, are open or trustful to our neighbors, people put in the open walls, curtains, alarm systems, everything else. Uh, so this is one in which I just want to show that this romance of glass in the 1920s was certainly there as a new building material in the name of transparency, but it had this other dimension that people already in the 1920s are thinking that this is it is good to see through things, uh, but at the same time, it also can mean that you can't be seen. And so there's always some of the about the material, and that comes out especially when they're really uh, uh, um, 
introducing this into mass housing in Eastern Europe in the 1960s, the kind of nervousness on the part of citizens about the implications of living in glass boxes. Thank you. Yes, please. Just a, a question about the major designers who were identified with the Nazis. Uh, was there any either things that they took from the Bauhaus or things that they rejected directly in the Bauhaus? I'm thinking of Speer and Porsche uh, as as major designers. I don't know others, but I'm sure there were. What was there uh, any? Any reaction to or or incorporation of in, into their their designs uh, for the Nazi, Nazi designers? You mean or Nazi yeah, art yeah, designers? Yeah. Robert Speer made that very clear. He said there's a lot to learn from Bauhaus, and he uh, was, was certainly in his memoirs he wrote uh, in he shot it. Uh, it was quite clear that there was not a huge amount of between the 1920s and 30s. It's not seen as a scam at this point because again, the Bauhaus opponents were outraged. Is draw that connection in this perspective that he thought were in a sense designing it differently. What Bauhaus is interested in kind of a horizontality, if you like, the verticality of Nazi design, think of like the 1937 Trocadero, which is kind of overarching figures, and the rest, in a sense, change the dimensions, but the, the building style, the effort to use mass production techniques, and as they, they understood early on, this is something that we can, we can work with um, very, very directly. So Porsche with the with this object of the car uh, was that no reference uh, ever to uh, to that to I don't people? think so. I, autom automobile designers. I mean, Gropius designed a car, the uh, the Adler himself in 1931. It's kind of very more almost more English uh, in terms of like the Rolls Royce. I've never seen anybody in automobile talk about that. There are any connections, and I don't know of any Bauhaus designers that went into that sector. Uh, but certainly the architects. Again, that was very awkward. Well, thank you, everyone, so much.